Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 2024 uh, Covey Lecture Series. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey, and pleased to see you all here today. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. George Vandermerva, who's an associate professor at the University of Guelph. George received his PhD in microbiology from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. And during that time, he actually spent some time here at Covey uh, during those PhD studies. He's um, a recognized expert in yeast nutrient responses and fermentation. He spent time during his career at the University of Stellenbosch, at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, Brock University here in Covey, and the University of British Columbia at the Wine Research uh, Center. His own research program at U of G is focused on yeast and wine and beer industries. And I think we'll be hearing about uh, a lot of that work here today. In the last five years, his group has focused on isolating, characterizing, and developing novel Saccharomyces and non-Saccharomyces yeast for targeted application in the brewing, cider, and distilling industries. He investigates the responses and adaptations of industrial yeast to fermentation-related stresses at a genetic, molecular, and metabolic uh, level. And he uses this information to develop targeted breeding uh, pipelines to generate yeast with improved production efficiency and or product quality and diversity in local fermentation industries. His research team employs standard microbiology, molecular biology, and cellular biology, as well as genetic techniques and advanced approaches in genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. George's research programs um, are and have been funded by the Natural Sciences um, and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, Agricultural Adaptation Council, and the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so uh, with that, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, George for a talk today in characterizing and developing yeast for the fermentation industry. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I came to, to Covey when that front part of the building didn't exist yet. <laughs> and you were a postdoc in the lab with me. I did look for some pictures. I could thankfully not find any. <laughs> that, would, that would have been different. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's been a while since I've actually been here. We've collaborated on some projects before. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing with yeast and mainly in the context of brewing. Um, so a little bit more focus on beer, but the principles here apply to one to the wine industry as well, and also to the distilling industry, which is something that's of interest. Um, so for me to to give a little bit of an overview of what we expect the the, the, um, the yeast to do, so this is old news for most of you guys, but we give it sugars and amino acids and some nutrients, and we ask the yeast to produce alcohol and all kinds of different metabolites, like glycerol and acetic acid, which is part of the central class of metabolism. And that's pretty much what it does. And then it produces all these other kinds of, of compounds as well that gives it flavor. Either it contributes positively or negatively to the flavor, and we can measure these things. And consequently, we can make it measure flavor compounds, and we can measure how it produces or uses sugars, and also alcohols, and ultimately at the end of the day, these readouts gives us an idea of its production efficiency, how well does it actually do the fermentation, but, and then also the flavor production at the end of the day, how it does so. This is our expectation of the yeast, right? That's not necessarily what yeast like to do, right? <laughs> this is what we ask it to do. So if we think about this process per se, we break this down a little bit, You've got uh, a variety of different kinds of sugars that the yeast uses, and there are all these kinds of transporters that bring these uh, nutrients into the cell. Um, and you've got fermentable sugars that the yeast can simply take up uh, that are either uh, mono or disaccharides, or trisaccharides or beer yeast that take these things up. Um, and then there are also extracellular sugars that have to be broken down extracellularly and then consequently taken up by the yeast. So if we think about these kind of things, fructose and uh, glucose are present in equimolar and amount in wine yeast, in, 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 in grape must. If you think about cider, there's a heck of a lot more fructose than there is glucose and sucrose. If you think about beer, think about water, 
it's got very little fructose or glucose, but mainly maltose or maltotriose. Right? It's a, by far in higher concentrations than the other sugars. It also has extracellular uh, sugars in the form, form of complex sugar, dextrin, that it has to break down extracellularly. It mainly via yeast can't do that. And consequently, these are taken up by the by transporters, and then there are a series of metabolic reactions that are uh, that are um, performed by enzymes to produce these things, right? These metabolites. As soon as we put the yeast in a stressful environment, then that goes out the window or its impact to varying different extents. And so, this metabolism, these enzymes, these, these reactions we depend on are influenced by stresses that we have within the fermentation itself. So what are these kind of stresses then that we have to consider when we think about fermentation? And so nutrients is the first one, is to be given enough of the nutrients that we actually, that the yeast needs to perform the fermentation. That impacts how well it performs. There are inhibitory compounds that can be present within the, uh, within the substrate itself. Phenolics, for example, can be a negative, can be a compound that inhibits uh, depending on the concentration and what kind of phenolics they are present. All right. um, a, a variety of different kinds of fungicides, for example, that are used in the field can influence how yeast form. It's a fungus. All right. So consequently, there are a variety of different inhibitory compounds that can impact how the yeast form that are present within the substrate. Hyperosmotic stress is another one, is how much, uh, what is the, the osmotic stress or density of the, um, of the uh, substance that's being fermented. The more sugar, for example, that's present within the, um, within the, uh, the substrate, the more osmotic stress there would be. So ice wine, in, in your instance, or high gravity warts, present the stress to the yeast that interact there. Yeast like to actually ferment at a, or like to uh, um, do its uh, fermentations at about four and a half to five pH. That drops significantly during fermentation because it produces things like organic acids and consequently that impacts how well the yeast ferments. The one that I want to stand, that I want to, want to talk about a little bit more in detail today is temperature. It's how do we actually, how does the yeast experience temperature? We spend a lot of money on cooling fermentation at that or getting fermentations at a very specific temperature so that yeast can perform their function. Right. As soon as things start to warm up, then the thing, then uh, different kinds of structures within the yeast get imp uh, gets impacted. Protein start to denature. The plasma membrane loses its permeability, or its permeability is impacted. The way that transporters in the membrane that I spoke of earlier, the way that they function, gets impacted by temperature, and consequently, that gets impacted if we actually increase the temperature. So the same thing goes for when we actually cool it down a lot. So in beer, there's lager production that takes place at like 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. And then you think about ice wine fermentation that's typically in the, uh, you know, below 10 degrees Celsius is at least where it starts. So consequently, all those lower temperatures also impact how fermentation operates, how those transports function, and importantly, how membranes function. Not only the plasma membranes, but membranes within the cell. And so consequently, that's a big stress right, for, for yeast as they perform their functions. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that there's also intracellular stress that we often forget about. So consequently, due to metabolism, there are a variety of different kinds of things that are produced within the cell that are inhibitory or even toxic. Reactive oxygen species is one of the main ones that's being produced during normal metabolism, whether it's fermentation or the aerobic growth, it doesn't matter, ROS is produced, and it influences, it oxidizes things like DNA membranes and proteins, and they lose their functionality, so we have to deal with that. There's also the production of medium chain fatty acids as part of the, the fatty acid biosynthesis. So octanoate and decanoate, for example, are toxic to yeast, but they make them during fermentation. One of the ways in which they deal with that is to esterify them, make them less toxic. It doesn't mean that it's not, the, the, the fatty acids themselves are not produced. Ethanol by itself is a denaturing agent, even though we love it when yeast make ethanol. They don't really love that a lot because it negatively influences them. Fortunately, Saccharomyces has an ability to, uh, to combat that uh, to varying extents, depending on what the yeast is. And then lastly, organic acids. They influence how metabolism is actually produced. Acetic acid is something that 
those of you that's come through Debbie's lab would be very well familiar with how acetic acid works and all kinds of other um, uh, other organic acids as well. That B2 weak organic acid stress that impacts efficiency. So consequently, we have a variety of different kinds of stress conditions in which the yeast has to adapt to and to perform their fermentation, right? So that influences efficiency and also what kind of different metabolites are being produced and what the flavor profile of the yeast would look, of the product would look like at the end of the day. So how does the yeast cope with this? First of all, they have to obviously sense that this is around, so they, that these stresses are around, and then they adapt. There are a variety of different things that they can do to adjust to these uh, stressful conditions. They can perform neutralizing reactions to take, for example, some of these stresses away. We spoke about esterification of fatty acids, that's one of them. Dealing with ROS, for example, would be neutralizing the reactions. They can make intracellular protectants that will help them to combat these stresses. We'll get to some of them later on, they can alter their cell membranes. Uh, they can get rid of some of these toxic compounds by just simply pumping them out of the cell, or they produce chaperones, proteins that help to fold other proteins or protect membranes against these stresses. So there's a variety of different kinds of, ad of adaptation, uh, adaptive responses that the yeast can actually do to adjust to this. So what is it that I then do? What is it that we do in our lab? Is we try to identify all these stresses we spoke of before, characterize them in more depth, and we can talk about temperature a little bit. And then we use that knowledge to develop new strategies for the fermentation industry, in which we can either develop yeasts or strategies to do fermentations, in which we can circumvent, or to at least to some extent, neutralize some of these stresses and give you a yeast that actually can perform its function more readily within the fermentation industry. Sometimes it leads simply to uh, 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 process efficiency that's better, or you can perform it potentially at a different temperature. Sometimes you also impact the diversity of the product. So consequently, you can make something at a, at a, can make a product that has a different kind of flavor profile, profile that's associated with it. But there's some variation that can come into that. I collaborate in my lab. I collaborate with a, with a local yeast producer, Scott from that. So I'm ashamed of plugging in here. Um, and I work with them very closely. We identify industry-focused problems, and based on that, we develop research projects that we then carry forward. So stress responses and working with that, and how the yeast responds to nutrients are some of the things that have been ongoing now for a couple of years. We collaborate with some industries, uh, most notably the cider, and the, uh, the uh, fermentation you know, or the, the brewing industry of late to develop these products. So it's very much an industry-driven um, research um, program that I have going right now. And to get into the little bit of the genetics and the, and the, and the weeds a bit with, with looking at yeast. So we first have to think about domestication right, in the context of, of fermentation. Many of the yeast that we work with have been used in, yeast, in uh, fermentation for centuries. So consequently, they've adjusted. When you compare the genomes of a wild yeast to that of a yeast that's used in fermentation, they look vastly different. And consequently, you get, if you do that comparison, you get something that looks like it's a phylogenetic tree, or it is a phylogenetic tree, as indicated over here, that you compare to a, to a standard yeast. And you can see there are a variety of different kinds of groups. This is the wine yeast, it's indicated over here. And then there, and then there are yeasts with a mixed genetic background. We don't really know where all of these come from. And then we've got two groups of beer yeasts. I'm going to give this one to beer one. And it's got uh, its origins in um, Belgium, Germany, US, and Britain. And then beer two, that's up here. And they are genetically or phylogenetically very different from each other. Both the, the wine yeast and the beer yeast groupings, phylogenetic groupings, are very distinct. Right? And they've been domesticated in you and being used in different kinds of fermentation. And that's why they are so different. During this domestication process, and I don't know if you guys can see that from the back, but for example, they've adjusted to use maltose for the beer industry and malta trios. So the genes that's needed for that has been amplified right? uh, within beer yeast. And you can see the beer one yeast um, here has, uh, it's indicated in red, they've got multiples of these genes duplicated, whereas beer two does not. Actually, that's wine, it shows that 
for the for the wineries itself, it has not duplicated this specific motors uh, uh, cassette for enabling motors and multi cures metabolism because there's no maltose in wine. Right, this glucose and fructose. Right? So beer yeast have been domesticated for that purpose. <coughs> beer yeast can also produce or yeast can also produce phenolic off flavors. So they have the capacity to turn compounds, phenolic compounds that are present, like ferulic acid that's present within plant material, they can decarboxylate that to form for um one black or four VG. It's it's sort of a spicy clovey like phenolic flavor associated with that. And depending on what the beer is or what the wine is, you don't necessarily like that to be present in the wine. So through domestication, through selection by the brewers, uh, they've selected yeast that actually lost this capacity. So if you look, for example, at the, um, at the beer yeast down here, this is a major group of ale yeast, beer one. Most of them are blue indicate here, which means that they've lost the capacity to perform this reaction. However, there are some yeast in here too that can form this reaction and that can make for very specific applications, like say on yeast, for example, that make that kind of beer that have this flowy like characteristic associated. Interestingly, interestingly, some of the wine yeast in here, used here are also positive for this, which may or may not contribute to something that the wine would want at the end of the day. Leave it there. The other thing, so these are all traits that were selected for that contributes to the functionality of the yeast. On the other hand, they are also, through the, the degradation of the genome during domestication, it loses its ability to, to mate, to, to reproduce sexually. That's a problem, especially if you want to breed with the yeast. Right? So you've got to keep in mind that some of these yeasts have retained the capacity to actually perform sexual reproduction, whereas others do not. And it's important to recognize that some of the yeast, for example, in year one, have entirely lost this capacity that don't solid and other associated functions, whereas in year two is variable. Why yeast, interestingly enough, some of them actually retain that functionality, more so than a beer yeast. Did. So it's important to recognize this. So the question that we then have is based on this domestication, we know that these yeast have actually adapted to fermentation to a variety in different contexts. Can we use what we've learned to domestication of these yeast if we look at their genetic makeup and we look at these adaptive responses that they have to fermentation? Can we combine those and actually come up with a yeast that's more tolerant to, for example, stresses like temperature and then see if we can breed something that has newer fermentation? The distilling industry can do with, for example, fermentations that are performed very readily without detriment at high temperatures. So every other industry, right? So the questions that we therefore uh, ask is can we identify and characterize the yeast that have dependent traits uh, that could diversify production? Can we make the, the fermentation to a high temperature or quality? Um, how does temperature impact the yeast performance? And ultimately, can we unravel, uh, unravel some of these traits by using high throughput approaches like some kind of omics approach or something, genomics, proteomics, etc. So we're going to touch on those things as we move forward. So this is where I want to introduce you to a group of yeast that you may or may not have heard of before. So there's this group or this area in Western Norway that, that where they have been making traditional farmhouse ales for generations. We can take that back to pre the industrial age. The furthest we can go back it's like the 16th century where they started making these yeasts in documentation that we have through a story that I'll introduce to you in a minute. So these little blue bulbs here represent different cities or areas where they've actually made uh, where they make this uh, kind of product. So they make these traditional farmhouse ales. The way that they, they do this is they basically prepare a wort that is, and they let it cool down to the temperature that's approximately the temperature of a cow's udder, right? That's how it was listed in the, in the historical uh, references, right? So that we have since determined is around 35 to, 70, uh, to, uh, to 37 degrees Celsius. And then they would seed that fermentation. They would add yeast into that. That's unheard of for what we currently do in our industry. We would never do that, right? Temperature is much lower because we are, our yeast can't tolerate that. 
So how do they inoculate this? So they have this wooden ring, it's called the quite socket. So these L, these yeasts are called collectively quite. Right? That's the, the main four of these Norwegian yeasts. So on this ring, they have a mixed population of microbes. That includes yeast and bacteria. They simply throw that in, fermentation starts, they yank it out and they hang it up in the barn. Right? Now it's Norway, and so it's cold. Right? So these yeasts hang in the barn, it cools down significantly, it dries out, and then it's re reused again, same population, to restart the next fermentation. So these yeasts are fermenting warm, and they dry and desiccated, and cold adapted at the same time. So they expose to all these stresses in one fermentation part, and they've done this for four centuries, four plus centuries actually. So consequently, these are super stress-adapted organisms that's been through that for years. So what did they do? We expressed interest in these things. Richard actually heard about these yeast in, in, the, in the conference where he was at. And so they shipped us a bag, subsequent bags as well, with shards of yeast that they broke off this. This is how it arrived at our lab which is against every single protocol that you would hear of, right? It, it just arrived on our doorstep. We put these things in YPD because you've got, to spread, you've got to sweep this out. We put them in YPD, Richard went to grab lunch. When he came back, it was fermenting. That's the foam, right? So they are super active. These beers are made within three days. And the fermentation is done. So what we did, is we isolated these to purity and we generated a gene bank, a, a strain bank with both about 300 of these uh, strains and we selected a subgroup of, of, of some of them and started to, to identify what they are like, what, what some of their characteristics, did pilot fermentations in the work and then we looked at their fermentation by measuring specific gravity and we did HDLC to look at their sugar metabolism, ethanol production and so forth to get an idea of fermentation efficiency and we did some GC analysis to look at their flavor compounds. We also, with a group of six of these, we sequenced it to see what the genomes look like. And so the sequencing was done the short reads as well as the long reads so we could actually have a construct of what the entire genome looks like, not just SNPs, not, not, not only um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So this is a group of people that actually started the work. So Richard uh, was a master student when we started with this. Caroline Tirawa was also a, a master student, subsequently uh, uh, technician. And Christopher Kroger is from VTT in Finland that we collaborate with. And this is our historian and uh, expert on the history of Quaik and how it has progressed in Western Norway, Lars Hassel. And to this day, we collaborate with all these people. We've got some papers set up in the pipeline uh, as we speak. So what did we find when we look at these things genetically? And so up here we have BR1 that I spoke of before, and down here is BR2, that's the wine yeast. And when we use the sequences and we actually look at the away fits of the phylogenetic tree, it's a subgroup of BR1. But if you actually phase these genomes, you can see that you will see that we know that where one of these uh, parents come from the other ones unknown. We are currently in the process of developing a paper that will give us more insight into where that second parent comes from. Um, this is some detail of the of the genome of the yeast itself. Um, it is tetraploid. We've confirmed this with this with flow cytometry, and then here we also get some insight into its core viability. As you can see that they have sacrificed some of the viability to some extent, where you've got around 50 to 60 percent uh, for some of them and then for some of them like Storadol for example there's no viability that's associated with their spores so it's worth making. So that varies from strain to strain. You have to go test this. If we think of how these relate to each other in, a, in the principal component analysis this is where the quite these are, these are pure ones and this is one. So they separate from each other quite distinctly through genetic analysis. They're not the same um, but they are related. They show signs of domestication. I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but they're pop negative. For example, they don't 
have the capacity to perform these phenolic off flavors. If you look at the genetic uh, data here, this is the PAD1 gene, the first one, or the cofactor that functions in the decarboxylation reaction performed by FTC1. These mutations are all um, high impact mutations. They are either premature stock codons or French shift mutations. Um, the numbers that you see here represent the four alleles that's present within the genome. Zero means no permutation, no permutation. one means a mutation. And so consequently, you can, for example, see for one and one that's homozygous for all these mutations. Consequently, it's used largely its capacity to produce 4VG, which we've confirmed with GC as well. So I'm not showing that. So that's the kind of um, uh, um, genetic data that we've received through sequencing that confirms the phenotypic uh, data. Um, what's important to recognize here is that these point, point mutations also occur in most of the other yeast that are also POF negative. So through evolution, that happens all the time, that specific point mutation. It's a single point mutation, a single nucleotide change that alters the phenotype of this specific uh, trait. The other thing that we uh, just want to quickly emphasize here, if you look at motors and motocure metabolism, because these yeasts actually um, have to use high concentrations of, of maltos. Um, when we look at the, the replication of different kinds of alleles or genes, this is a group of genes that are implied with uh, maltos metabolism. There are copy number variations in the genomes of these uh, yeasts, in which you have 14 copies, for example, in Grandin, one of the genes that's associated with maltos metabolism. And so you've got these, these are copy number variations. So the, the exact gene is duplicated that many times. To give you an idea of how efficient it can potentially perform its fermentation. So when we did a fermentation screen on these, um, the red, we used um, a series of different, of different um, quikes. So they are captured in the top part of the year. Um, and then our controls are down here, WLP001, or Cali, as you'll see later on. Uh, that's our, our control fermentation, and then the rest of them are all compared to that. And you can see some known BEEs ferment faster than this commonly used one, but so does some of the products, which gives us an indication that these things ferment really efficiently. We look at flavor pro profiles, um, the gray boxes here, indicate uh, concentrations of flavor compounds that's produced at low threshold. Um, they're not only present, obviously, in quikes, but also in some of the control yeasts, but it means that they produce really useful flavor components. In this instance, we show, we're showing ethyl uh, caproate, caprylate, and catanoate that has fruity characteristics associated with it. So it has this capacity to make a fruity kind of beer. That's the bottom line to it. So they ferment really well. And that's the bottom line. Why does that come They make nice, they make beer with an interesting flavor compound uh, profile, but what else? When we actually subjected these yeast to different kinds of stresses for 24 hours and then incubated them in fresh media and to see whether or not they grew and just took uh, optical density measurements, um, you'll see that most of these quites down here improved upon what we would find in our control yeast that better down here. And so consequently, we came out with a, this is a temperature control yeast that's supposed to be uh, temperature tolerant, which are the same or in some instances better than our yeast, uh, that the quikes, um, but it gives us an indication of how efficiently this, uh, these yeasts can tolerate heat and ethanol. And so consequently, we came away with a, from our initial analysis that Richard did, we came away with the this, this summary that this is a subpopulation of DR1, they're both negative, they can metabolize multiple cures potentially really effectively. Um, there are some other uh, traits associated with their fermentation um, that I didn't show here and that they're temperature tolerant. So the next question then would be, is, well, how well do they perform then if we actually change the temperatures on them? Because we're talking about high temperature fermentations. That's what we want to do. So we have um, two people, Barry Foster, he's a PhD student in my lab, currently writing up his thesis, hoping to defend in two months. 
um, and the biofilm dish and MNA uh, also he that actually work with him. So he tested for quite yeast. He tested uh, sorry, uh, six of the, of the, of the quite yeasts, uh, via one yeast uh, controls and then a via two yeast as a control. And they wanted to ask the question, how well do they actually ferment at different temperatures? They went all the way from 12 to 42 degrees Celsius. And it took time points, as indicated over here, and we stopped after five days because we thought that the beers would be done by three days, four days. We started with an initial uh, specific gravity of about 1.04. I believe that's about 12 or 13 bricks, somewhere around there for context for you guys. So less sugar than you would add in one mass, and that's it, our seed weight that we used. So first off, what's really interesting is the fermentation profiles that we have here in temperature. Uh, this is a loss of specific gravity, means that it's fermenting really well. The faster it can do that, the better it ferments. Uh, the color of the block indicates the temperature. And these are the controls at the top, beer ones, beer two, and then these are the quikes. And what is striking here is that the fermentation at higher degrees, uh, at higher temperatures is absent or there's no fermentation that happens in, um, in the beer ones and our temperature tolerance strain battles to do so um, at 42 degrees Celsius. Whereas for some of these quakes, they really ferment really happily at these higher temperatures. So they can decrease the specific gravity really quickly. If we change the way that we actually portray that data, this is what it looks like. So this is after three days of fermentation. You can see um, that the, the, the line, that the red line that's running through here is a specific gravity of 1.01, which is a target for ale production. Uh, you can see that the quakes at 35 degrees Celsius and at 37 degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius, after three days they already reached that target. So the beers are done. They're made by that stage. If you think about how that happens for um, our controls, they tend to get there at 30 degrees Celsius, even though their fermentation is optimally at 22 in the industry. Right. And then after five days, you can see this is the fermentation profile. The interesting thing here is that our controls does not ferment at high temperatures. It doesn't reach, after five days, it doesn't reach our, um, our target temperature. It can do so very effectively at its optimal control, uh, at optimal temperatures at 22, 22 and 30 degrees Celsius, the green bars over here, um, but it can't do so at higher temperatures. Right? So it definitely is impeded to do so. So that's specific gravity. When we think about the specific the, the, the sugar consumption, now I apologize for the busyness of these slides, um, but if we look at maltose, first off, the glucose and fructose concentrations are way too low to even mention here. That's all done within the first six to 12 hours. It's completely out of the picture. So maltose metabolism, then if we think about how fast these fermentations, how far the econ function goes, you can see as we this is temperature at the bottom here, these are the individual, this is beer one, beer two, and twice. Um, if you look at how the how it consumes uh, uh, maltose after, um, uh, after five days, it really battles to do so at higher temperatures, whereas um, at the optimum temperature, it has no problem. Quite the range of by which it consumes models is much broader than those of our controls, right? Even at the especially at the high temperatures, right? Now the problem child when it comes to to sugar consumption for for wort is maltotriose. It's three sugars that are combined. Their consumption typically happens last when the yeast is the most stressed. And so one of the pro main problems with the spike yeast is the rear is head here. Even at, at the optimal growth temperature, they don't consume all of the, of the model trios, right? If you compare that to the controls, they do a much better job, especially Kolsch, which is one of the BR1 controls. It consumes most of the model trios at their optimal temperatures. However, well, the quikes never really do that. However, it can consume model trios up to above 75% at higher temperatures, especially for these three strains. So bottom line is that there's variability in how efficiently these quikes will actually use multi which means that you can't uh, um, 
put them all under the same umbrella. They have really different phenotypes depending on what you're looking at. Right? Some of them are really more efficient at doing these kind of things than others. For example, one of the one in this instance has a much broader computation and efficiency profile than you would, for example, C4 larva. Right? So they've got, you've got to pick the strain very carefully. You need to know what the strains can do before you actually use them. You can't uh, bracket them all together. So the next question then is, well, how viable are these things then at different temperatures? So this is where the interesting bit comes in. We look at, we, we grew these strains at high temperatures, give viability estimations of these 35 degrees Celsius, our control strains were fairly viable as soon as we got, uh, the quakes are totally viable. As soon as we got to higher temperatures, there's some variation of correctly. The BO1 uh, control started losing viability quite drastically after 42 degrees Celsius. Our temperature tolerant control was more tolerant than BO1 as expected, the blue bars. But then when we look at the, the purple ones, you can clearly see there are some of them that are actually more viable than others. Again, there's a range of viability between these different yeasts, and some of them are super viable still at uh, 42 degrees Celsius, which was a nice surprise to us when we actually saw that they can very happily perform their functionalities at that temperature. So then the question was, okay, well, why? Why is it that these things are temperature sensitive, uh, temperature tolerant? So one of the adaptive responses that I mentioned to you before is the fact that it can perform or pro produce a protective uh, um, compound that can protect its intracellular environment. And one of those things is triolose that is present within the cell and it responds to stresses that's being made in different kinds of stressful environments, the disaccharide, and it stabilizes membranes and helps to actually keep proteins functional. So when we looked at triolose metabolism or uh, production within these strains um, at 30 degrees Celsius, the BR1s produced some triolose, BR2 did not, and then there was a high amount of triolose produced by our quakes. So it was like, okay, well, maybe we're onto something here. Maybe it's the triolose that is actually giving us um, this um, protection. Uh, by the end of this experiment, a couple of days down the line, we still saw a high level of triolose that's being produced and just decreased in the, um, in the controls, which told us that once the triolose is made, it doesn't really degrade that much when it's in the, in the, um, in the quietness. When we did the same experiment at 37 degrees Celsius, which obviously is higher temperature, consequently we saw the, the, uh, um, the PO1 produces some triolose and then it's gone after, um, after a couple of days of growth, whereas you still see this maintenance of high levels of triolose within the, the quite strange. So what happens to triolose is it's degraded by a neutral triolase. It's an enzyme that breaks down triolose. So we did triolase activity assays on these yeasts and our BO1 controls have various efficiencies of triolase activity, whereas our, um, our quite strains, for the most part, does not. So it lacks the beer one um, activity when we went to our genome um, sequencing data, and I'm not showing you this uh, here, but this neutral triolase NTH1 has a couple of single nucleotide polymorphisms that's close to its acti active site that could impact its activity. We're currently busy in our lab to unravel whether or not that is the reason why we actually see very little triolase activity to link the genetic data we have to the phenotype. So triolose activity is, is um, uh, production is one of the mechanisms in which quite can potentially result um, in its or gain its, its thin tolerance. But we know that there are a variety of different kinds of stress responses that yeast can actually employ to combat temperature. So one of the ways that we can go about doing that is to do proteomics in which we have a snapshot of the proteins done at different, um, of the different yeasts done at different time points during a temperature shift experiment. So Barrett did an experiment in which he compared a lab yeast that's very close to industrial yeast, a beer one yeast, and then a couple of quite uh, yeast strains. And he grew that, he pre-cultured that uh, to 30 degrees Celsius as a pre-heat stressor, uh, pre-heat uh, uh, um, treatment. 
uh, collected a sample, then he exposed this to a prolonged heat, uh, a six hour heat treatment at 40 degrees Celsius, collected samples as a, as a post heat treatment, and then extracted the proteins and did proteomic uh, analysis to look at what are the different, what are the differences between these different strains. And so we first did um, some statistical analysis that could clearly tell you that the Vermont, the beer ones, is vastly different from our Twice and also very surprisingly, our lab yeast control. That's very close. We knew it was very close to the yeast. What's also interesting is that the pre-treatment is very different from the post-treatment in all instances. And so there are significant shifts between the beer one and beer two as they respond to heat treatment. Not only are they different from each other, but there are differences within the treatment itself. So what are some of the interesting things that came out of this? We saw that um, central carbon metabolism, and I'm not showing all of this, there are significant changes. What we are comparing here is uh, post-treatment to the pre-treatment, and everything that you see in red is up-regulated, everything that you see in blue is down-regulated. The first box is the uh, CMPK, it is our lab yeast control, BF2 is the second box, and then the remaining three are quites. And everything that's in bold is statistically significant. So basically what you can see here is that all these storage carbohydrates, PLOs and glycogen are impacted by the stress response. For us it was really uh, striking that you have triolose, for example, that was impacted by a variety of these different yeast, uh, of these different proteins that are misregulated. What we did know though is that this would have been a very confusing result for us that the, the NTH1 is upregulated in the sense that there's more of this being produced. Well, we know from our experiment that there's a high concentration of triolos that's being produced. And we also know that this NTH1 is mutated from its medical function. So even though there's more protein, we know the protein's inactive. And so this is the importance of actually looking at what you see at all your data to intersect of what does that really mean. Because if we didn't know the genetic data, we would have thought that there was more activity with NTH1, which is not the case. And so it's important for us to actually have a holistic view of how you actually interpret this data. So first of all, then, uh, we have a variety of different central carbon metabolism genes that are responding um, to this heat treatment, which gives us an idea of its uh, metabolic activity. The other thing that's really important as well is that the way that it responds to ROA seems to be active. Remember, one of the interstellar stresses I spoke about before is reactive oxygen species. And that's the way that the yeast deals with that is to perform neutralizing reactions in which it gets rid of the ROAs, and there are a variety of different kinds of proteins that does that. And they are listed here, catalases, for example. Um, you've got all kinds of uh, thyroidoxin, protein reductases, and peroxidases. And you see some of these are actually upregulated to a large extent within um, within the uh, um, within the uh, the quite yeast, but not within Vermont. The second box is lowerly expressed. The second box is lower here and here as well. So consequently, this suggests that the quites actually have adapted a mechanism in which it can actually protect itself against ROAs better than Vermont, for example, the BR1 yeast. And one of the things that I did when I came in this afternoon is I went onto my phone and my lab technician emailed me is that he did the ROS screen and said that it works for Vermont, there's more ROS than quite. So we now also have the wet lab that data to actually support this. In addition to that, the chaperone proteins that help to actually combat this seems to be upregulated um, as indicated over here. And it's also highly, highly expressed over here for um, to help with responding to those stresses. So what do we then do with all this information? Well, how do we go about and actually use this? So one of the things that I mentioned before is that we can harness that and actually breed yeasts that are stress tolerant and breed them with other yeasts. Maybe we can come up with something that's a little bit more uh, uh, resistant to stresses. So we did this with, um, with two yeasts we did hybridization, which is not a foreign concept. I mean, uh, you guys did this here at Covey a couple of years ago already. This is not new news, in which you can uh, breed industrial strains, use two industrial strains, make them, and consequently have a progeny that could potentially have traits that come from both of those. We use the same kind of approach here. 
we use a clay yeast, which is one of these guys, or clay yeast that's in this grouping over here, and it's uh, phylogenetically very distinct from the beer 2 yeast. Remember, the beer 2 yeast are the ones that have retained most of its mating capacity. The beer ones has lost most of those, so we're kind of limited with how efficiently that will work. It doesn't mean we're not still trying, we just haven't succeeded yet. <laughs> it's a process. <clears throat> so we use two of these flight yeasts, we um, make it into a beer one, uh, beer two yeast, a saison yeast, which have very specific characteristics associated with the flavor profiles. And we generated two strains, a North Sea, one, uh, North sea and Milner. These are the guys that actually performed this work for us. Brian is my technician that is super capable and texted me the, the data on that. Ross, that is that. Um, so, first of all, let's look at the viability of these yeasts. So, we did the same kind of viability as we did before. Vermont is our control, it loses viability over time. The Belgian says on yeast, the beer one it itself also has viability issues. It, it dies over a period of time at high temperatures, but it has an interesting uh, profile for fermentation. And then these are the two clikes that maintain their, their viability. We have two different hybrids that are being produced, North Sea and Milner, from this, and consequently we see that they lose viability, um, or uh, North Sea loses some viability fairly quickly, uh, or it's fairly okay until 37, then it loses a lot of viability very quickly. Milner, on the other hand, seems to be viable for a longer period of time. That's an interesting strain, consequently, for us, because it can tolerate an efficient ferment, hopefully, at high temperatures. So let's go ahead then and look at the fermentation profiles that we have associated with these. Um, so here we have specific gravity decreases, again, with a target of 1.01. Um, the blue line um, would indicate uh, the saison, oops, the blue line is 22 degrees Celsius, and the red line would be 37 degrees Celsius. Right? So this is how they ferment. And consequently, the Belgian saison strain that can ferment, can ferment fine at uh, 37 degrees Celsius, not a problem. The quite strains also get down to, to around that time period. We know that one of the quite strains has a problem at uh, at 22C, um, it's a consequence of this confirmed previous data, but when we actually look at the, the, the hybrids, they both prevented really efficiently. If you look at the slopes of these, it's, it's, uh, um, it's steeper than what we have with either of these parents, and consequently it they prevent really fast at 37 degrees Celsius. If we bar graph these, um, you can see that within 24 hours, Milner has actually already achieved its target. Um, it's, target uh, specific gravity. So you can make a beer in 24 hours with this thing. Right? Um, if you let it go a little bit longer, and you can see a variety of the, uh, some of these hybrids and the quikes actually meet the specific gravity requirements after two days, and then this is at the end of five days, where all the strengths pretty much got to that. Right, so it gives you an idea of fermentation efficiency and how fast these things can ferment. If we look at carbohydrate, um, Consumption, um, multitrios consumption. Remember, this is a this is the problem child. Uh, we see that the multitrios consumption of the hybrids is lower than the parents in all these instances. So it can effectively utilize the multitrios more so than the parents. It's not at zero, granted, but it's very good for multitrios metabolism for babies. Um, if we think about dextrin, remember I, I mentioned to you that dextrin is a is an extracellular. Um, complex sugar that needs to be degraded, that can be degraded. That's not necessarily a trait that you want in all your beers. We call these, these beers with, uh, the strains that can actually uh, degrade dextrin. We call them diastatic yeasts. What they do is they excrete uh, um, uh, glucoamylase extracellularly that can break it down. That's great in beers where you want it. It's a tragedy in beers where you don't want it because it can lead to bottling problems. Right? So that can be a significant issue. Um, that depending on where you use it, right? So that's a trait that has to be looked at after the fact. What we do see here, though, is that the parent strain, we know that the parent strain, the, the Belgian Saison strain, this is a diastatic yeast, and consequently it would result in dextrin utilization. The quakes are not. Um, they have limited capacity to actually perform that function, but we see that our, our hybrids inherited this trait from the parent, that it can actually break down. 
protection, right? So it's acquired that trait. Uh, it has this diastatic trait associated with it. Um, and then lastly, when you look at ethanol production, uh, these quites uh, or these hybrids produce ethanol basically the same amount of ethanol. Same kind of context, right? So no problems there. Um, if you look at acetate and glycerol production, so we know that um, glycerol production and acetate production are linked often through osmotic stress in the sense that, uh, that the yeast produces glycerol as an intercellular metabolite to combat osmotic stress. In the process, it uses NADH, um, and then in an effort to recycle the NAD, it, um, it goes to uh, uh, acetate production in where it consumes NAD plus to generate NADH again. So when we look then at the production of glycerol and acetic acid in these different yeasts, we can see that the, um, the, uh, the parent, the BR1, uh, or the, sorry, the BR2 parent, it produces uh, a certain amount of, of, of glycerol that increases uh, slightly, but not really uh, very much. Um, the stats is indicated here. Uh, so they come out in the wash, they're fairly similar between both strains, um, dependent, uh, independent of the temperature that's being produced, uh, where it's at. We see that one of these flights actually produces more glycerol than, um, than uh, the, the parent. When we use this quite in making a hybrid, the hybrids also have high amounts of glycerol uh, that's being produced. By contrast, then you also see that the acetic acid that's being produced is slightly lower than what you would expect, and we anticipate that there was this balancing reaction that took place um, for these, and consequently we have some indication of where we stand with acetic acid production and, um, and uh, um, uh, glycerol production. The, limit, the limitation for, for sensory analysis is, is 200 milligrams per liter, I believe. Um, so we're right at that with some of these hybrids. Uh, it's right there. So consequently, all right, let's keep ahead. I think I'm just some time for questions. Um, so we've identified a variety of different kinds of cellular mechanisms that the yeast can actually use to combat um, um, increased thermal stress. Uh, these responses vary between these quite strains. So this is really important to recognize that you can't treat all of them the same. And that you can actually translate to any kind of yeast that you use within any kind of fermentation. You can't treat them all as the same because they're not. They're genetically very different from each other and consequently that translates into how you can use them. Any, any kind of one size fits all approach is, is likely gonna experience some trouble in some or some challenge in one context or the other, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a common way uh, that people use to actually treat all yeast as if they are the same. That's not necessarily the best approach. But that means that you have to actually understand how these yeast function. You have to understand them, consequently you have to characterize them. Um, the, the hybrids offer us a, an opportunity with selected hybrids to actually breed yeast that can have applications in different kinds of industries. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail of what these are, but typically the ones that are related to high temperature fermentations. Um, so this leads to a variety of different kinds of breeding partners that could be available through these more stress tolerant yeasts. We've, with any kind of stress that we've thrown at these yeasts, they are typically more tolerant than most of the other yeasts that we try to, to or that we compare them to. Um, we've only characterized six of them. There's hundreds more. And so consequently, there's a lot of scope for development uh, for a breeding context with applications in a variety of different industries. So the people that I want to thank would be um, the, our research team that I've spoken of, our collaborators. Um, these are the guys that gave us all the work to start these experiments with, and this is the people that pay the calls. So, thank you very much. We've got time for some questions. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it seems that these yeast strains are very culturally important to this part of the world. And yeah. They have a long history. Is this the first time that they've opened themselves up to research? Like, is this 
Um, no, it's actually gaining a lot of traction now. Um, we've, uh, we were the first people to start publishing on this, but there are a, a few more papers that are coming out with different kinds of applications of these kinds of yeast with, with surprising substrates. Um, because they are so stress tolerant and they can actually uh, withstand a lot of different kinds of environmental impacts, People are fermenting all kinds of weird things with it and consequently having success with it because they are remain viable. The, 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 um, one of the things that we do do is that we, between Richard and, my, uh, and, and myself, Richard more so, he actually goes back and he meets with these farmhouse, uh, farmhouse ale producers they have a conference every year that, that he attends and so he, he goes and he presents our, our um, research and he speaks to them directly and so we've got a, we've got a, a collaboration going with him and also I don't think Lars is actually on this picture that I'll show you here um, but Lars Hassel is uh, heavily involved with keeping the traditional brewing community together within Norway and consequently we connect with him quite regularly and also with Christopher Progress. And as I mentioned before, we're currently in the process of actually delineating many of the yeasts in addition to um, these uh, quite yeasts and what their origins are in a paper that we're hopefully going to submit by the end of March, beginning of April. So it's, a, it's an active collaboration and we work very closely with the Norwegian community to, to keep them uh, abreast of what we're doing. They, have, uh, of course, tell us that, you know, we can do better with ours because they have the community of yeast that work together. Right. We're yeah. working with individual strains, right? So there's a lot of scope for even developing that for yeah. Yeah. They can be, yes. There are other ones that are also like this that are fast fermenters, um, but that would certainly fall into that category, yeah. George, I have a question for you. Um, when you were characterizing these yeasts, you were looking at, you know, their temperature tolerance for growth, and then looking at how fast they're fermenting. Um, what about the aroma profile? Like, yeah. They, so, like, I know you probably have done measurement. There's a lot of data here, but yeah, I'm just interested. On yeah. Things. So we we did the aroma profile. I just mentioned briefly the aroma profile that we got originally. So we did a aroma profile with the, the last uh, hybrids and then with the controls and the hybrids themselves. We got that data about two weeks ago um, in which Brian processed the, the data and sent that to me and we looked, we're starting to look at that in more detail. There's nothing that jumps out as terrible in the sense of, oh wow, it's producing this massive off flavor that we didn't expect. Um, and we certainly didn't experience that during the production. However, there are some metabolites that are being produced that are, we have to do some thinking about explaining how that is coming about, thinking about how they are coming about. There are certainly differences. Um, as you would expect, because they're high temperature, you would expect that there would be massive changes, for example, in fusel oils and higher, higher alcohols. There's not that big of a difference. That's different from the parents. We do see that there are, with these quites in general, there are differences in fatty acid and fatty acid ester profiles. Mm -hmm. I think that's, and that's consequently where we see some of these differences coming. Right. I was specifically going to ask you, what about volatile thiols? Because we know they, they form better at warmer temperature because the enzymatic reactions work more efficiently. Yes, so if, if we can get a cheap way to analyze them, <laughs> uh, because if we, if we want to ship them off to have them analyzed, you know, elsewhere, it's a, it's a, you've got to sacrifice your eldest, your firstborn, to actually get that done. But no, it's um, for volatile th thiols, we've used some of these quites to actually, or, um, Escarpment has used some of these quites to breed um, yeast that actually have a capacity to do biotransformations, especially of wort precursors that they would liberate uh, thiols, right? Uh, because they can actually perform that function. We know at the end of the gene is that's associated with that. Yeah. And consequently, we've got some information about that. We haven't done with our hybrids, we haven't done any volatile thiol work yet. 
mainly because we don't have the capacity to do that in-house at 12. But I mean, we'll if we can talk, then that'll be great. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I know that you mentioned that uh, you know when you collected this Norwegian yeast from different parts, one of the main characteristics is like they can withstand higher temperature, fermentation at this temperature. And then once you characterize all these uh, strains, is there uh, like any reason that you selected these particular two strains to work with? Yeah. So first of all, you can you can breed with them. Right, so we, we test their spore viability and their ability to actually perform mating in mating ex, uh, experiments. And based on that, we, we have a, a short list that we actually pick from. Um, and then we also look at what are the characteristics within those species, those specific strains. Uh, temperature tolerance for the ones that we picked are the highest. Their viability is amongst the highest. And consequently, that's the reason why we picked them, is to go after those specifically. There are other yeasts, for example, that aren't necessarily as temperature tolerant, but they've got very interesting flavor profiles. Right, so that's subject to a different kind of breeding stream where you know, think about, okay, well, we're not looking at stress tolerance necessarily, but we want a certain flavor compound that we might be interested in pursuing. So it depends on what the trait is specifically. In this instance, we were going at, after temperature tolerance. Well, George, uh, a small oh. token of our appreciation uh, for you. Don't want you to forget about the wine. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you very much. So That's please, awesome. Uh, join me in thanking you for this. Thank you. And then, just a reminder please join us next week, uh, Wednesday, March 13th at 2, as we welcome Cubby's principal scientist, Dr. Uh, Sud Pujari, and he'll give a presentation on the importance of clean plant programs for grapevines. So we look forward to seeing everybody. Thanks. Thank